Welcome to the King Win for Charity Easter Edition 2015 Hearthstone Tournament. I'm your host, Callum Leslie, and here with me to cast for the next three days, 16 of the very best players in the world battling out for $5,000 is TJ Azumakuti Sanders. TJ, thank you so much for joining us on King Win. Yeah, this, is, this should be a really great event. Uh, of course, for charity is always is always a, a great thing, helping out Child's Play. And uh, these 16 players are, uh, like you said, some of the best in the world. So it should be some great competition. Absolutely. We're going to be battling out over the next three days. We're going to have four matches today in the first round, and then tomorrow we'll complete the first round and play the four matches of the second round. And then we'll be back here on Sunday for our semi-finals and finals. I mean, the players that have won these tournaments in the past, players like Strife Crow, players like Life Coach, these are the very best players in the world. And we have some uh, excellent players playing this weekend as well, as well as some players you might not have uh, heard of before. It's all going to be best of five conquest up until the semi-finals and finals, which is going to be best of seven. And uh, TJ, you want to take us through the tournament a bit? Yeah, of course, conquest. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be best of five all the way up until the semifinals. So on Sunday, the semifinals and the uh, third place match and the finals are going to be best of seven. Of course, it is all going to be conquest, which means each player has to bring uh, three unique classes or four for the finals. And they have to win one game with each of their classes in order to win the series. So the winner uh, must switch decks and the loser can switch decks if they want to, but they don't have to. So a little bit of mind games going in, into that one as well. Uh, Conquest as a, as a format is actually pretty interesting because there is a lot of mind games that goes into it. Uh, players have to have well-rounded lineups. They have to make sure that um, they're very proficient all the lineups because they can't just rely on 3 0 with a certain type of deck. Um, they can't just rely on having skill with two decks and being able to just throw the first one out as like a free loss. So you have to win with all three of them, so it makes it really interesting. And uh, I really like the format um, overall. And uh, you mentioned some of the players that are playing in this. Um, of course, uh, Jab and Number Guy is going to be the first matchup. Uh, Ecop and Dog, Ecop from Cloud9, Dog from Complexity. I'm that one. Yeah, uh, Temple Storm's Hyped versus Fanatic's Frezar. And uh, Dignitas' Chalky versus um, uh, w one of those new players that you said, one of the players you might not have heard of from uh, Punchline Esports Club, Ekta, and his uh, his one of his teammates from from Punchline Esports Club, uh, Oliak, is going to be um, playing later on in the weekend as well. So it should be pretty cool. Absolutely. We all, uh, yeah, so those are the matches we have coming up for you today. We've also got players like Tide of Time, Ty, Skara, Show. Forsen, who I know a lot of people will be looking, will be waiting for. The Forsen boys will be here. He's going to be here tomorrow, uh, playing in this tournament. He's going to be playing in the final game of the first round. But uh, yeah, as you say, Jab versus Number Guys is the very first game. But don't forget this charity world, this uh, tournament. We're all here for charity, so raise money for Child's Play. Uh, all the donations that you send, 100% of the donations will be given to Child's Play. We raised uh, nearly four and a half thousand dollars during the last Kingdom for Charity. So let's see if we can hit that five thousand this time, and, and maybe even go even more and raise the most we've ever raised in a, a King Win tournament. Child's Play, of course, a really great tournament, raising money to buy consoles and, and gaming gaming equipment for for kids. It's uh, it's a, a great charity does a lot of really good work and uh, Kingwin has raised a, a ton of money for a child's play so far and we're keeping going with that and obviously uh, money already also being raised during the Kingwin Pro League every week which uh, coming this week is going to be starting Tuesdays and Wednesdays and we'll obviously talk a bit about that I think during the broadcast uh, the ongoing massive league the biggest league in Hearthstone going on right now but uh, yeah so our first game is going to be Jab versus Number Guy Jab a player some people might not have heard of before he is on Team Heartlytics uh, his teammate Muzzy, who we're going to see in the tournament tomorrow, recently won the Pinnacle 4 tournament. But Jab's a player who's been around for a long time and was kind of one of those players who, if you think back to sort of the mid-2004, you know, mid early to the, uh, mid-2014, early 2014, there was kind of a, there was the established pro scene, who were the guys that were involved in things like ESGN, and then there was the, the, uh, the kind of underground pro scene. With mm -hmm. guys like guys like Firebat were involved in, and uh, you know where he came from, and Jab was kind of part of that early lesser known pro scene. Yeah, and he, he's a, a big practice partner for a lot of players as well, and he's a, a streamer, and he doesn't get that many viewers, but I think he deserves some more because um, he's a fantastic player, finishes high legend almost every season, and uh, he's well known for playing um, Hunter. I think is the biggest one. Uh, and you say, oh, well, players uh, well known for playing Hunter, maybe not the, the most respectable uh, uh, feat, but it's he, he's really an innovator when it comes to that class. And it's not just face Hunter, as mindless as some people may think it is, is, is not as, as mindless as it may seem from the surface. 
and uh, mid mid range hunter as well. He plays that all the time. Shaman as well is another class that he's known for playing. Shaman, uh, aside from Seed Story Cup, where players had to play a big marathon of games and actually had quite a bit of success, there still wasn't that many players that played it. And uh, I don't I don't know if he's going to be able to bring it, but he also plays a whole lot of Shaman and he's very proficient with that class as well. We do actually have the classes here for this first matchup, and we'll get into those in a second. But obviously, just looking at Number Guy as well, Number Guy made it all the way to the Hearthstone World Championships last year. So, you know, he's certainly a very proficient player playing for SK Gaming. For those of you who are uh, wider esports fans in Hearthstone, will know that SK Gaming, one of the very, very top teams in all of esports, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in League of Legends, one of the high flying European teams. So, uh, certainly not to be sniffed at. An international team as well, players like Renia are on that team. So he's going to be taking a lot of influences from a lot of different metas into his practicing. Um, I know these guys work very well together. Number guy, uh, very passionate guy. I think if remembering back to the the assembly tournament that he played in, he, you know, can can sometimes get let things get to him. But also that passion bleeds over into his gameplay, and uh, he takes everything very seriously and is very very invested in everything that he does. And that that's the kind of commitment that I guess he's going to need uh, going forward. But what are your impressions of number guy, TJ? Uh, he's super young. Uh, that was, that's what the the first thing that um, that spoke to me, I guess, when he was playing through. I think he was 17 when he was playing through the the BlizzCon World Championships. So um, he was one of the youngest players there. He's still one of the youngest players in in the pro scene. Uh, I remember a story of him having to um, like forego school to to go to one of the tournaments. So uh, it's it's pretty cool to see young players like that still having quite a bit of success. Um, but it's uh, he, he's really impressive with this play. Uh, in some tournaments, it, it seems like he, he he takes it seriously, but he might get a little bit nervous. Um, at, at least in, I can't remember which tournament it was, but he made quite a bit of uncharacteristic misplays and it it forced him to, to go out in the tournament early. So we'll have to see if that's going to be a big deal here. Um, it's online, so he's from the comfort of wherever he chooses to be. So maybe that'll that'll help him. Uh, but this should be this should be a really great series, and these players are two that may not be the most well known. Number guy maybe a little bit more, but two players that are that are definitely to look out for, especially in this bracket. Absolutely, I mean, a lot of very very talented players in this bracket. As you say, players like these guys, like some of the guys we're going to see coming up, are, are players you really sh maybe should have heard of but never have before. We've got the classes for the two players here. We're just a few minutes away from starting this game. Uh, total lineups: obviously, it's eight, three decks each, best of five. Jab is bringing Druid, Hunter, and Warlock, and he's going to be opening with Warlock. And number guy is on Mage, Hunter, and Warlock, So, and he's opening with Hunter. So very similar lineups. So obviously, we could see completely different archetypes. Uh, I know the, the Demon Lock variant or the Weird Lock variant of Warlock has been very popular right now with uh, varying amounts of demons in it. The sort of hand lock is still quite very popular. Hand lock running things like Malganus is also quite popular. So just those little micro tweaks can make all the difference. But then we could see a resurgence of Zoo. We've just had Imp Gang Boss come into the game, and that makes the Zoo very strong. I've been uh, been rocking the Zoo on ladder myself. It's been good fun. Uh, a little bit retro. And um, another important thing to say about this tournament we haven't mentioned so far is that uh, all the all the cards that came out yesterday from Black Rock Mountain are eligible to be played. These players yeah. didn't submit their decks uh, until today, I believe. So they've had, you know, we could see some Dragon Paladin. We could see all manner of things. Maybe a Core Rager in the uh, Hunter. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see what's going to come in. But uh, it's it's always going to be interesting to see these players experiment. Some of the cards. Uh, I know last weekend at Seat Story Cup they were allowed to play in the the final the playoffs with the cards from the new wing and things like the Druid of the Flame were coming through as being quite popular as well. Um, yeah, as I say, the Hunter could be a face hunter, could be a mid range hunter, could be the control hunter. We've seen some from some of the uh, the crazier European players. That's uh, a deck that I know a few European players have been experimenting with. But uh, you were telling me last night, TJ, you've been playing a lot of handlock, a lot of the more traditional handlock, and still finding yeah. that to be quite strong as well. Yeah, traditional handlock still pretty strong. Warlock is 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 probably one of the most versatile classes right now, which is um, not something that you hear very often. But there used to be just two different archetypes of warlock. It was either Zulock or handlock. Like that was it. Demon hot before demon lock existed. But now there's so many different ways and so many different hybrids between demon lock and zoo and demon lock and handlock. There's demon lock zoo, mid range demon zoo, heavy demon handlock. Uh, so it's it's pretty crazy, but judging by his, his um, well, it looks like we are going to um, move to the game soon. But yeah. um, 
Now, the one thing here is that the depending on the archetype of this Warlock, is going to depend hugely on the matchup against Hunter. Traditionally, Warlocks have been very weak across the board against Hunter. Uh, the new Zulock, especially with Imp Gang Boss, stuff like that, makes Unleash the Hounds just super strong. Oh, man. And Hunter definitely has the advantage in, in, that, in the Zulock matchup. But uh, Handlock, especially Handlocks that build more uh, to counter aggro, uh, like with Zombie Chows and stuff like that, is actually really strong. Because if you build a, uh, against Face Hunter, if you build a wall, it's really hard for him to get past that, especially with most Handlocks putting in uh, sometimes two anti kill bots. Yeah. Makes it really hard for a hunter to, to find that last burst of damage. And it looks like we are seeing the hand, so it looks like it is going to be um, a zoo lock, but there's a Dr. Boom in there, so. I was just going to say, this could be a very interesting zoo, and you see the Worgen Infiltrator perhaps suggesting this is a face hunter from Number Guy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as you say, I mean, the zoo is really difficult because when you're running things like Implosion in Zoo, which is pretty much a standard at this point, hunter is the only matchup where you want to roll low on your on your implosion because yeah. you just know when you roll four unleash the hounds is coming next you just know that's what happens but we're yeah. seeing a pretty strong start here from jab he gets the knife juggler out on turn two uh it's able to kill that leper gnome would have been hoping to kill that worgen infiltrator but certainly isn't going to sniff at being able to take something off the board and actually this is the instance where Zoo can actually beat Face Hunter, getting those good value minions, particularly Knife Juggler. Knife Juggler is absolutely crucial in this matchup because there are a lot of one health minions. Yeah, that's very true. Um, a lot of times in this matchup, you will see the Warlock take control early on. Um, but when it really comes down to when you're starting to run low on cards, when both players have exhausted it, the, the Hunter's just going to come out in, the, in sort of the mid game area just because. The Warlock's going to have to tap for new cards, and the Hunter powers, the Hunter is going to be weaving in his hero power turn after turn. So when both hero powers are damaging the Warlock, and you're in a scenario where you're playing two aggressive decks, the player that's being damaged every turn by both hero powers is usually going to be the one that loses that race. So yeah. um, it, it's really tough, and this is a really bad hand for um, uh, for for Jab. It's He's just so clogged. He's got the Melganus early on, which could be a factor later on, but I don't even know if this game will get to a turn nine. No, I mean, we can see from Jab's hand here, this is definitely not a traditional Zoo ladder deck. This is uh, kind of, I guess, perhaps a hyper-aggressive demon lock. It's, a, again, a completely different archetype from anything we've seen in a lot of tournaments. The Bane of Doom there, the Doctor Boom, the Malganus. So the, there is a lot going on here. He goes straight for the Doom Guard and... Well, he's probably quite lucky that that mortal coil disappearing, but does lose his Doctor Boom. Um, thought it's difficult to know what he's going to go for here. I thought we might have seen the Bane of Doom to try and get some better board presence than use the Doom Guard. This suggests maybe he's not running uh, Void Collars if he's just able to play the Doom Guard out straight away. Often that's a, a card you'll you'll wait and activate a Doom uh, a Void Collar for. Yeah, I mean, chances are he probably is playing Void Collars. He just can't afford to to be that slow. That's true. Um, and you, you see there, this is one of the only matchups where the Hunter sort of needs to play, uh, Face Hunter sort of needs to play a little bit more of a board control oriented style. You notice the turn before, um, instead of hitting Face with his Eagle Horn Bow, which, I mean, most of the time you're playing Face Hunter, you just, you can block Jam out face. your whole monitor aside from the <laughs> face and then just like blindly move your cursor until it mouses over the face and hit it. That's usually the way that you play it, but you can't really leave a board for Zoo because they have, they have so many ways to to buff up their board. Cards like Power of Overwhelming, Abusive Sergeant, Defender of Argus. You don't want to give them any good targets for that. So even though you're playing Face Hunter and you're you're overwhelming oh. Caveman Urge, oh, that, that's There's tough the right there. Yeah, and uh, it's difficult to see. Actually, that's actually a really bad hack for Number Guy. The double kill command without the beast to be able to activate it. A 7-5 Doomguard staring him down. I was thinking, are we going to see that Doomguard on the Mad Scientist? Uh, we did see it. haven't quite seen what the secret is yet, uh, but it's likely to be an explosive trap. It may be a sn one snake trap. Uh, if it's a snake trap, that's a really, really bad time for a number guy. There are some face hunters that do tech in freezing trap. In the Pro League last um, a couple days ago, I forgot which player it was, but they actually teched in a, a freezing trap. But judging by this move, it's definitely explosive because there's no yeah. way that he would he would make that move without it being explosive. Yeah, uh, which I mean, is good. I was wondering if we were going to see him uh, tank the nine damage face there to clear that Malganus, but uh, clearly is an explosive trap because he's leaving it at one health. And this this puts Jab in an interesting position here. He is going to take two damage. He can put his opponent down to seven. 
two Malganis? And if, uh, I mean, can, I mean, he can even put his opponent down to, to two health with the second Doom Guard. Yeah. And that looks like what he's going to go for. And what turned out to be a poor hand was made quite a bit better by the Bane of Doom. Well, and I don't think there's any way out of this. Yeah, that's going to be first game going over to to Jab with the, the, the nice Bane of Doom. Well, there you go. Bane of Doom, since it's been, I guess, buffed, uh, is one of, the, one of the first times, I think, in, in since release, the Blizzard has ever buffed a card, uh, expanding yeah. the pool of demons able to be summoned by Bane of Doom. So we have Malganis now as an option, and you saw the Malganis there. So that's a win for Jab. His Warlock is now locked out. Um, that's pretty good, actually, for him, I think. We did say he might struggle against the Hunter. That wasn't certainly wasn't a favored matchup. And in Conquest, whenever you can win an unfavorable matchup, that is a pretty big tempo swing. Oh, yeah, that's pretty huge. And, I mean, that that was a not only... he It felt like he should have lost that game. Um, double Kill Command is actually a really good hand against Zoo because it allows you to race. And all you need is a beast, which you... I mean, he drew an owl at the last, which could have been... If he didn't draw that Mulganus, the the game ending turn, um, almost any other demon in that situation, maybe with the exception of like a Doom Guard, because of the the whole uh, racing scenario in that type of situation, probably would have lost Jab the game. So it's uh, it, it's a little bit unfortunate, but I, I mean Bane of Dune, it's really cool. It, you call it a buff, I guess it's a buff, but it's really just yeah, I, I, well we can call it a buff. It's establishing a, what it what it should be a, a correct what should have been yeah. correct for quite a while, but it is certainly a buff to the card, and we're uh, going to be moving to this next match pretty soon. And I'm aware that this next match is going to be a hunter mirror match. Now, that suggests to me that I guess Jab isn't feeling confident with his druid against Hunter because he has to get a win against this Hunter most likely uh, yeah. in this match. He doesn't necessarily have to, but it's very likely he's going to have to beat this Hunter again at some point because yep. it's such a strong deck for number guy. Uh, the Druid can really have a hard time, but this definitely suggests he's probably running Face Hunter himself, because I think the mid-range Hunter is pretty, pretty weak against the Face Hunter. Yeah, it, it really is. And it also indicates that he's probably playing a mid-range Druid, uh, a faster mid-range Druid, maybe double combo with like Amber Thorson, because that's the only reason why he wouldn't choose Druid in that situation. Heavy Ramp isn't really that popular right now. I know playing on ladder the past couple of days, I've seen maybe one or two uh, heavy ramp, which it might be a, a good addition to your to your conquest lineup if you assume there's going to be a lot of zoo or a lot, and a lot of hunter, uh, which the meta might be shifting towards. Um, but judging if he didn't pick it against what he probably thought um, number guy was going to go with, which usually if you playing an aggressive deck in round one, you, you want you're trying to get a quick win with it early on. So you can most likely guess that number guy's going to go with the hunter again. Then uh, it indicates that that druid is probably fast. But um, going with the mirror matchup, and actually, uh, we'll have to see in a second. Um, I think we're going to jump into game pretty soon here. Um, it's a pretty bold move, though. If he figured that he was going to go with hunter, going almost certainly queuing into a mirror matchup with with his own hunter he's got to have a lot of confidence in himself to to win that mirror matchup if he if he assumed that number guy was going to go with the hunter as well absolutely so we're going to get into it here very very soon as i say the hunter mirror we're going to see the face hunter from number guy um pretty pretty confident it's a fairly standard face hunter we are getting to the match here but it looks like jab might actually have a more mid-range hunter we see the sludge belcher web spinner we saw a piloted shredder in the mulligan as well so this is going to be a difficult matchup for Jab. Yeah, Sludge Butcher is a fantastic card, though, uh, in this matchup and against Face Hunter in general because it just blocks so much damage usually. A lot of times they'll have to use a Silence on it, and that means um, that Silence isn't going to be there for later turns, and it also means that Cheap Owl that they usually use to burst you down later on is not going to be there. And if they kill with, like, a Kill Command, that's burn they're not using on your face. And also they still have to get through that second... The, the sludge that comes out, yeah. which is usually really hard for Face Hunter because they have to use a bow charge or a wolf rider that they have on board. It's really tough. So that card, Sludge Butcher, usually trades two, sometimes even three for one against Face Hunter. 
Having said that, in terms of the overall matchup, it may well be that Jab is, and you see Quick Shot in there for Jab, which is one of the new cards from Black Rock Mountain. It may well be that in the grand scheme of the matchup, Jab realizes that Face Hunter is really bad against the rest of his decks. So I guess maybe wants to give Number Guy the Face Hunter win as quickly as possible, so he can then beat his his mage and his warlock. And that's the kind of we talked about the tactics involved in conquest. Yeah, that's the kind of sure. thing you've got to you've got to think about. And triggering the snake trap here for Jab into the, uh, sorry, for Number Guy into the Unleash of the Hounds is uh, is pretty good as well, getting a lot of presence on board. He's going to just clear here, though. Mm -hmm. it's very pretty, yeah. It's usually a pretty smart idea to trade in, in Hunter vs. Hunter matchups just because second Unleash could be devastating if, they, if either of them have it, which is one of the best cards in the mirror matchup. So, um... I like the fact that he uh, decided to decide to trade there. Now he did get King Crush, so that's a pretty exciting card, <laughs> and it doesn't usually come into effect in Hunter versus Hunter. But it actually, uh, I've seen King Crush when it does come out. It's usually a game ender because by turn nine, Hunter versus Hunter, you usually have your opponent sub ten health. Uh, it's usually coming down to those last couple cards, and King Crush can be what wins. So we'll have to see if that's going to be the case. Well, the curve is getting pretty perfect here for Jab. Does have the turn five Valkyrie, turn six Savannah, and pretty much any other matchup. That's uh, that's pretty much an awful for mid range hunter, right? If you can curve into those two. Yeah, but <laughs> it's also very slow, and sometimes you can't afford to have slow cards against Face Hunter. So next turn, if he spends his whole turn laying Savannah high main, that's a lot of damage he's going to take on the return, because there's a possibility of double arcane golem coming out, which would mean they would put him out with that bow charge. 8 health, and that's if he doesn't come across the, the rest of the board, and he's dealing with the stakes on the board, he has no AoE to be able to deal with that. If he goes with the high main, then there's going to be a lot of damage staring him in the face. But he doesn't really have much of a choice. Unless he wants to take out a 1-1 one -one with quick shot. Yikes. Yeah, that's pretty difficult. He's just going to go ahead and slam the Savannah here and hope he can overwhelm the board, but yeah, this is pretty difficult, and you've got to be worried here if you jab of, of what's sitting in the hand of Number Guy. Is it something you can use with Kill Command? Is it these double arcane golems? Is it something like Leroy? Uh, there could well be a lot of damage coming in, and that's actually a lot of damage on the board. I mean, there's nine damage just represented in what Jab can see, so there doesn't actually have to be a huge amount, even if it was just a, a Leroy and an arcane golem. That could be pretty nasty, but the trade there, probably a smart move from his part. Yeah, I don't know, though. Uh, in that situation, I'd like to try and make it a race. Uh, try and say, hey, that one damage is probably going to be inconsequential. So I'm just going to hit your face and hope I draw into like a second kill command next turn and be able to tur make like a 20 damage turn. Um, it's really tough. He does have Houndmaster next turn, so we can turn that, that high main into, into a little bit of a wall, but it's going to be really tough. Yeah, we're just going to see the Arcane Golem and the Wolf Rider come out here, and this could well just be Number Guy making it a race, like you said. He's going to go all in here, and uh, this feels like a pretty pretty safe strategy, I think. So much yeah. is actually lethal in the hand, even without even if uh, Jab is able to clear everything on board, and it would take probably quite a bit for that to happen. But something like a Houndmaster on a Savannah High Main could actually wreck his day here. Yeah. Um, he just doesn't have enough damage to do anything here, so he's got to clear as much of the board as possible. So I like Knife Juggler, Houndmaster, Quickshot here. Yep. Uh, knife Juggler, and then Houndmaster, and then Quickshot the Arcane Golem and try and trade off as much as possible. That way he can set up a huge damage next turn because he'll have... Oh, jeez. 6 plus 8, 14, 18... He'll have... 27 damage I think next turn if none of his board is killed so he'll be able to kill him quite easily the following turn it all depends on if if uh, if number guy can get through this wall it, it's gonna be tough I mean he's he has to draw into a second owl I guess a second owl 
And that's oh. not it. That's a Lepronome. So <laughs> it looks like Jeb oh. might actually be able to beat the Face Hunter here with mid range. That Houndmaster just absolutely perfect what he needed to put up that wall of taunt. The early silence coming down in the Sludge Belcher, like you said, I always so often in Face Hunter use to push through at that crucial lethal turn or to push yeah. through to get damage on at the absolute necessary point but sludge belcher is just such a big target for silence because of the second taunt coming out of it even if you can get through it that he had to use it then and now he's staring down a 8-7 at savannah high main and it's pretty hard to see how you come back from that and he doesn't even know that king crush is waiting in hand to finish him yeah he's got to go for the style points and finish the game with king crush he could actually finish it with Oh no. Oh yeah, he could finish it with Kill Command, so. I mean, there's Lethal staring at him on board. He doesn't even have to use either of the, the cards in his hand, but it looks like Nobra Guy's gonna stay in, maybe try and get a little bit of... Oh. Actually, out of there you go. He concedes. Yeah, that's a shame. We didn't get to see the King Crush, but the King Crush would have been enough there, and I like to think that Jab would have used the King Crush to finish it off. You know, he's a, he's a guy who appreciates the, the flashiness of Hearthstone. But uh, that's going to be a tough loss for Number Guy to take. And Jab's Hunter is going to be locked out now. So all he needs to do is get one win with the Druid against either the Mage, the Hunter, or the Warlock. Depends what Warlock variant Number Guy is running here. Uh, and of course what Mage he's running. But the Mage and the Hunter could be pretty good against the Druid. So uh, it's one of the things with Conquest again is that even if you go 2-0 down, if your opponent has a deck which just can't get a win against your three decks, then you really can struggle. And that's... We saw this, uh, the, the example that I always use the, from the KPL is uh, Show versus Firebat, where Show went 2 0 up and Firebat, yeah. had, but because Show's known as a warrior player, Firebat had just brought three anti warrior decks and was able to reverse all kill him and win the match. And, and that's something that is very, very possible in Conquest. So it's not, not for County Number Guy out just yet. Does, I did think that his lineup was going to be pretty strong against Jabs, and he's going to stick with a Hunter and go for his third game against obviously the druid of jab talk talk about this psychology a little bit here tj <laughs> because it's something that i i always worry wonder about when i'm watching conquest games is if you lose your first two games with the same deck does it affect you mentally to pick the same deck again and you know you're picking picking a loser deck i guess you know do you do you is there perhaps you know you know when you're playing on ladder and you, a deck like loses three games in a row, you think, well, I've got to change, because clear, clearly that deck isn't working. You stop playing Constructed, and you boot up an Arena run, and then lose three games in a row in Arena, and then you close Hearthstone for good. No, but yeah. <laughs> that, that seems like the experience of, of the average player. But um, in Conquest, <clears throat> a lot of times you, you, you open with a deck. There's two strategies. You open with a deck that you know you can try and sneak a quick win with, which is Hunter. Or you open with a deck that you know has a good matchup against a lot of things, like Druid, which was like a popular strategy in last year of Sandy. A lot of players try and go with either their weakest deck or a deck that they can get the quickest win with, which it feels like number guys going with Hunter. And there's two mentalities. Either one, he's got a lot of confidence in the Hunter and he just wants to try and get the win out of the way. Um, or two, he realizes that he's gonna have to win with the Hunter anyway at some point. So he might as well just go with it because it's going to be the quickest deck anyway. He, he can't really be too tilted right now because uh, the, the two losses that he had, um, he didn't necessarily play bad. He didn't make a misplay. He knows it's not a bad deck because, he, I mean, it's a it's a tried and true deck. It's it's Face Hunter. You, you can win with Face Hunter. It's, uh, I know that he probably just picks it because he, he just wants to get that win with Hunter out of the way so he can move on to his next decks. We do see from Jab here, we see the combo in hand straight away and the wild growth as well, which is pretty good. Ancient of Lore, but I think I reckon obviously he's probably going to mulligan everything except the wild growth, uh, obviously. But uh, and an Innervate coming out as well and a Wrath. So Jab has some pretty good tools early on here. Uh, the Wrath could be pretty crucial in this matchup, especially as he can coin into it. Does have the wild growth as well. Um, in fact, he could he could uh, coin Innervate wild growth. <laughs> and Wrath here to deal with this Lepronome and get ahead if you really wanted to, uh, to to surge ahead as quickly as possible, but I think that might be a little bit of a risky play. Very bold. Yeah, that'd be very bold. Um, this matchup can be a little bit tough, especially if you're a mid-range Druid, uh, just because a lot of times your hand is going to be slower, and he does have tools for ramp, but at the same time, they're not really high impact cards. They don't have an immediate impact on the board. Cards like Azure Drake and, and Ancient of War, yeah, they draw you cards, but 
what's on the board right now is still going to be on the board next turn if you're if you're playing one of those cards. So uh, you're sort of investing into the future of the game instead of dealing with what the hunter is doing right now. And by the time you get to the point where you can deal with what they have right now, it's already too late and your health total is too low. All they need is a little bit of burn. And they don't have those walls like Druid used to build when Face Hunter was super popular on the ladder. Um, Ramp Druid was like the, the go-to deck for most most players. You start on turn four with Ascension, turn five Druid of the Kalar Sludge Belcher, turn six you, you coin into your, your Ancient of War. The, the days of that are, are sort of gone now. Sunwalker, yeah. Yeah, because there, there was a period when like that heavy taunt Druid, not even just Ramp Druid, but it was a, a taunt specific Druid with things like Sunwalker was a little bit popular. But uh, like you say, even if you're able to innervate an Azure Drake on turn three, for example, your opponent has Animal Companion, and two out of three Animal Companions trade with an Azure Drake. And there's one of them there, Misha. So Azure Drake is a really, really bad card in this matchup. The Druid yeah. of the Claw is slightly better, admittedly, but it's it's really awkward to innervate into that and waste a mana. Um, he does have the Keeper of the Grove. I guess he can... Maybe silence the the taunt, or even just kill the mad scientist is probably what it would go for. Yeah, this is a rough situation. Most of the time, you want that keeper of the grove to come out really early, like uh, turn one or two, coin interve keeper of the grove, so that way you can deal with the first threat and have that keeper there, which is going to trade usually three for one. It gives you time to play your ramp cards, but he has it a little bit late, and uh, silencing the mad scientist is really big deal, uh, just because you know you won't have to worry about that explosive trap later on. You can get to the point where you can actually play Force of Nature, Savage Roar, because Explosive Trap is prevents you from doing that. And it looks like he's not even going to get to that point because he's already at 14 health on turn four, <laughs> turn five. So he has Druid of the Claw to sort of stop some of the bleeding, but he gets to that Druid of the Claw so easy. Well, I guess you could uh, you could innervate Ancient of Lore to heal. <laughs> that doesn't feel good. No, because you know that the amount that you're healing, you're using the Innervate and you're healing, but he has, what, more than 10 damage staring at you on the board. So the, the five heal that you're doing is just going to be negated plus some the following turn. And this, again, going back to the, the talk of psychology and obviously you haven't get these different wins. If you're, if you're Jab right now, you're not even feeling too bad about this matchup because you're like, yeah, this is a really tough matchup for me, of course. I'm not doing too well, and okay, fine, even if his face hunter gets a win, I still only have to get one win with this druid against his other two decks, so hmm. not a bad position for Jab to be in, it's certainly uh, he is in pole position right now, but Number Guy obviously needs to get this win, his back is up against the wall, and we're going to see him use the second Glaive Zuka to get the buff on the Mad Scientist, which, I don't know, he looked a little bit unhappy with that, I guess he... I guess he wanted it on the the abusive sergeant to trade because the mad scientist doesn't die to the, the hero power or a wrath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another and, awkward turn for Jab here. Yeah, this would most like this would normally be the stabilization point. Um, but Jab, I don't know. He's got decent cards to stabilize. He can deal with the board, and he has Ancient of Lore as a heal as sort of an emergency. So uh, the fact that. Uh, number guy's hand was actually clogged with weapons and he wasn't really able to develop his board in that situation uh really hurt him because he was forced to trade most of his board into that druid of the claw to clear it off and he wasn't able to keep on the pressure that's a terrible draw as well he's, he's gonna play the eagle horn bow and just burn so that's two glaive zuka charges he's actually wasted yeah. which is uh you know it's a decent amount of direct damage the war infiltrator very very late um Actually, not a terrible position for Ancient of War. Ancient of Lore here. I think you do have to heal, but Druid of the Claw off the top is pretty perfect. And actually, Number Guy, even though he's at 26 health against 10, unless he draws into the right cards here, uh, he's going to need a Beast. He's going to need Kill Command. He's going to need his Wolf Riders, and he's going to have to sack them into this Druid of the Claw. This this actually could turn around really really quickly here. Yeah, I actually like the Ancient of Lore. Uh, here because uh, getting the heal out on a turn where you're where you know you're safer is probably the better choice because you can get the heal plus the body in the board on a turn where you know you're not going to die and then Druid of the Claw the following turn to sort of you know put the nail in the coffin and close out the game um, but I guess I, I forgot that there was a trap there so proccing the trap and then playing your board probably a better choice in the situation 
Yeah, I mean, that, that is pretty good as well. And it, it is kind of similar of what you were saying about the healing with the Ancient Lords, being able to proc the trap in a turn where you know it's not going to kill you. Uh, that's pretty crucial as well, because it means that you can, let's say, survive another turn. He's going to have to use the weapon charge to kill off that Druid of the Claw, but does put his opponent to 7 health, so there's actually lethal sitting on board here, but we're just going to see pretty much an instant health here. Swipe coming into hand as well. Oh, the second Worgen Infiltrator. That is the perfect target for swipe in this yeah. deck, and I think we'll just see a swipe face next turn, potentially, and then probably a Lotheb to prevent things like Kill Command. Yeah. Wow. This is going to be <laughs> actually really close. It's going to be on a couple draws for uh, for Number Guy to win the game. I mean, next turn... Um, if oh, he draws and a team, Belcher! Oh, that is so rough. So, wow. yeah, Belcher swipe face here, I think, feels like a pretty, pretty good turn. Uh, take out everything that Number Guy has. Oh I mean, I don't know if he even runs a second Ego Horn Bow. Um, we've already seen three of his weapons, so is he gonna? It isn't really gonna draw into a weapon. I haven't seen the silence though, so that could help him out with the sludge belcher. But yeah, this is really rough here. Well, it's gonna have to be over two or three turns. And this turn, if he uh, if he swipes face and plays belcher, which seems to be the 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 correct play, he's gonna put him down to twelve health with eight damage sitting on board. Uh, so that's a, um, I guess just a second swipe. For lethal, Savage War for lethal, Force of Nature for lethal. There'd be a lot of opportunities. And since Number Guy has an empty hand, he'd be forced to do damage over two turns. Because if he draws the Owl next turn, he's still not going to have lethal. So it's looking pretty rough for, for Number Guy when he sees this swipe come out. It's not going to be good at all. Jab's thinking long and hard about this. I think he's, I guess he's trying to think whether or not he wants to play that Lotheb and lock out things like Kill Command and Unleash. But the Belcher, oh, he's not going to use the swipe. Oh. Wow. Cool. Face, I that guess, is. <laughs> I guess he realizes that regardless of what he draws next turn, there's no draw that he could that he could get that would kill him. Uh, even if he draws silence. Actually, no, if he did draw silence, that would have been lethal. Yeah, exactly. So That's that was... really risky. Really yeah. risky. I don't like that. I I don't like that play at all, honestly. I I just say I think that's you know that the owl is in the deck. You've seen it already, and you're actually you're in a pretty rough position here. Actually, I think you probably have to proc the uh, haunted creeper and now swipe face. Obviously, that that does give you a better value swipe than you had last turn. But I'm really not sure I'm a fan of that. I think that's Who cares about value right now. You care about your life. You care about your well, life. Exactly. Too. Uh, when you're, you you want to put yourself in a situation where your opponent can't draw into lethal. And swiping face in that situation... Oh, well, actually, no, that's not true. Because the following turn, Hero Power Kill Command would have killed him as well. Uh, because he was at 5 health. Um, so I guess it's the same amount of risk. It's putting him on drawing a silence or putting him on drawing a kill command. Which one are you more afraid of in that situation? So either way, I guess... Uh, there is a way that he could have died the following turn. So I guess it's not that risky now that I think about it, because he was at 5 health. Um, and this, this is kind of an awkward spot here, because he does, I guess he part of him want, maybe wants to play another 5 drop, but also he kind of wants to get that armor as well, um, yeah. to get himself a little bit of healing. But he's actually just going to go for the low Theb, and that does lock out the kill command. So it's going to be, I don't think there's actually any outs here for Number Guy locking out the kill command with the low Theb. And this is going to be a super quick victory for Jab. 3-0 against the Face Hunter in some pretty unfavored matchups for Jab. That's uh, a really, really confident performance for him to start off the tournament. You can see him smiling, nodding his head like, yep, that, that <laughs> just happened. And, I mean, you sort of have to question a little bit Number Guy's decision to keep going with that Hunter. You can't really fault him because first matchup, that's favorable. Third matchup, that's favorable as well. Uh, but Jab played that really well. Um, we initially criticized that last play that he made with the, the hero power, but you think about it and uh, the kill command seems more likely just by the laws of Hearthstone. Um, they always have kill command. Even when their hand is empty, they somehow have a kill command. So you, you, you always expect that more than you expect the silence. So I like that play. He, there, was, he, there was no way he could play around everything. So uh, he played that just about the best he could have in all three of those matches and he's rewarded with with getting the the 3-0 victory so really impressive stuff 
Yeah, well, that was a very, very quick series, obviously, much, much quicker than we'd anticipated for our first game. So probably going to have a little bit of a, a gap now before our second game. But that does give you a lot of time. Gives you time to go and check out Kinguin, pick up some new games. There's a discount code, which is uh, for charity. So you can get 5% off during this tournament. Uh, you can pick yourself a copy of uh, GTA 5. You can pick yourself up Mortal Kombat 10, any number of uh, new games that have just come out, all available on Kinguin. And of course, you could, uh, while you're doing that, spending money on yourself, maybe consider making a, a donation to Child's Play as well for the tournament. Uh, of course, Child's Play is a foundation that buys consoles and games for kids with cancer in order to make the last days of their lives more happy. Uh, there's a PayPal account which you can transfer the money to. There is a, uh, a command that you can enter, and it's also down below as well. Uh, we're also running a competition right now, so if you want to enter a competition, there's a command for that as well, and you can win 20 Hearthstone packs all throughout the tournament. There's uh, something on the page as well. So lots going on during this tournament, including some big wins for players like Jab as well. But uh, I guess this just goes to show, we talked about these players who you've maybe not heard of before. And Jab, uh, one of those players who I guess maybe comes into the category of uh, some of the best players you've never heard of. And mm -hmm. showing why he's you know one who people are going to have to watch for the rest of this tournament. Yeah, for sure. And uh, his teammate Muzzy as well, who we'll be seeing. Uh, those Hearthlytics guys are, are actually... A, a, a team to watch as a whole, not just players to watch, but a team to watch. They, I believe they recently picked up Koroniko as well, who's a Japanese player, streams sometimes. Um, he was the first player to hit Legend in uh, North America for the April season. So that's a pretty impressive feat. Um, Zixa was busy on EU, so that's that's what allowed him to sort of to sort of get in there. But that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, I think the next match is going to be... Um, next match is going to uh, be Ecop versus Dog Ecop that versus we're going to see. Yeah, just talking about Hearthlytics there for a second, you know, you talked about the team. And I guess one of the good thing, one of the things about Hearthlytics to, to keep in mind is the whole ethos of the team. And it's kind of there in the name, Hearthlytics. They're a very analytical team and all about, you know, getting the micro decisions right and just really, really seeing the game as, as well as possible and reading the game and having that kind of uh, that kind of control. And I guess, you know, like we said, you know, we kind of maybe judge the not using not clearing the board there but maybe he was being a little bit more analytical than us and i guess that shows why these guys are are pro players and we are not pro players those who can't play cast i guess is uh to paraphrase a saying but the very analytical players we do definitely see all the outs and that makes them very very dangerous yeah yeah if we were if we were playing in these tournaments we'd, we'd probably get 0-3'd the the, the the few times that casters have actually participated in in tournaments it, it has not gone well um i did finish in the the march march season i did finish pretty high on the on the legend ladder but um i played one i played like one deck so in conquest i'd be in quite a bit of trouble i'd win with my one deck and then i'd just be flailing for the rest of the what, what was your one deck uh control warrior oh wow. control warrior player. i also played I mech mage, face hunter. anybody can play mech mage Okay, we're going to take a quick 15-minute break. Like I said, go check out the Kinguin store, pick up some games, make a donation, enter the competition, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes for our next match. Ecom versus Dog. Make sure you come back. <laughs> 